Good evening, everyone. Um, what we have here today is, uh, is a brief discussion on uh, what the regulation may look like uh, in crypto space. My name is Michael Karenko. Uh, I'm a partner at uh, both the law firm, which is Senko Karenko, dealing mostly with capital markets, and uh, also uh, uh, in Cypher, which is an investment firm. So what, when I look at uh, the crypto space, I look at it uh, from uh, both the legal perspective and the investor's perspective. Uh, the way we do the panel today uh, is uh, instead of running through various questions, we've decided to make uh, uh, three short speeches. Uh, if we have time to follow up with questions, we will. If not, uh, we'll uh, uh, make the way to the keynote speaker to wrap it up and go to the uh, nice party afterwards. Uh, so, in terms of the order, we'll, have, we'll first have Avia Rika, uh, who is uh, uh, the head of uh, the blockchain committee at uh, uh, Near Porat & Co which is an international uh, Israeli-based law firm uh, who will provide you with the latest updates uh, and describe the latest trends in the crypto space. Then we'll have uh, uh, Dmitry Matveev, who is a partner at Alenikov & Partners. Uh, that is the uh, leading uh, Belarusian law firm. Uh, the cool thing about uh, Dmitry is that uh, he and his law firm were really behind uh, the uh, much talked about decree uh, on digital economy, which is uh, very often cited as uh, Belarusian crypto law. So he will share with uh, uh, you firsthand uh, the vision behind the law and what the Belarusia is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is going after. Uh, and then uh, we have uh, uh, the wrap up by uh, uh, Dmitry Shimkiv, uh, who uh, you, I'm pretty sure, uh, all know, uh, those who, uh, who are from Ukraine, for sure, uh, who is a former uh, head of uh, Microsoft in Ukraine and the, who is currently serves uh, as a deputy head of the presidential administration and uh, secretary of the National Reforms Council and uh, uh, National Investments Council. Uh, and he will provide us with some light on uh, what uh, Ukraine thinks about uh, crypto at the moment. Uh, before we start with Avia, I just thought I'll share with you some, uh, some uh, info on the research we did uh, just a just few days ago. What we did, we put all the, all the statements from regulators together uh, in, uh, and then calculated how many times we see the words uh, and which words we see. So what, what do the regulators say in their uh, statements uh, for the last year? And what do we see? We, we see the, a lot of words, uh, warning, protection, regulation, risk, taxation. We see very little number of words like innovation or stimulus. So pretty much uh, well, the regulators are uh, not on the innovation side. Uh, then I was trying to find a good map or representation of uh, what the regulatory space looks like on one slide. Uh, the latest one is from Coindesk, just released, uh, I think, like a few days ago. Uh, and, uh, well, basically, I had the question, is it a real, true representation of where we are? Uh, actually, this slide follows many other sources that uh, some of the companies in the crypto space produced. And in general, what are we talking about? Uh, when we talk about crypto regulation, are we talking about only ICOs, which many people used to, used to think? Or are we talking about much broader uh, uh, subjects, including cryptocurrencies and their regulation, infrastructure related to run crypto, uh, we're talking obviously about ICOs, not, for, not forget about tax. And of course, the blockchain as the driver for many of the transformations in, the, uh, in different countries. 
So I will pass the floor to Avia, who will, uh, as I mentioned, uh, run through the latest trends in some of these sectors. Now? Good. So I'm going to stand up because I'm not sure whether they kept the regulation panel for the end of the day because it's boring or because it's best for last, but I'll try not to, not to make it boring on my part. Um, so it's great to meet you. My name is Avia, and what I do most of my days is keep track of crypto regulation uh, because that's what my clients need. Um, and I need my clients, so <laughs> uh, let's start. First, I'm going to talk about uh, trends when it comes to ICOs, specifically for ICOs. So right now, the biggest legal trend that I think is worth talking about is the securitization of tokens. and. Um, we see a big movement towards securitiz securitization of tokens, mainly because regulators are waking up and witnessing the fact that many people are buying utility tokens, but I'm saying utility tokens because they have no utility yet, right? There's no operative platform behind them. So how are they gonna utilize them in the next year, two years, three years? What it means is they're actually investing. They're buying these tokens to sell them at a later stage and make profit. So um, that really uh, starts to feel like uh, uh, not an easy place to go to, uh, the utility token framework, especially if you have no operative platform yet. Um, but when you sell a security token, there are so many other things to realize besides uh, what do I need to do to sell a security, which is the whole afterlife of the token. You have so many implications when you live your life as a security rather, if you, rather than living your life as a simple token. Uh, it's immense. It's uh, uh, reporting duties and the fact that you can't be traded on any exchange, just the exchanges that are licensed for selling securities. Uh, and many people don't realize that. And when they understand, when they come to me, my clients, and they understand the implications of living as a security, most of them or many of them are deterred. So that's something you need to remember. Um, and that's uh, now the, the easy or the difficulty of the licensing process, the registration process, to be a security in many jurisdictions is high. Uh, that's why crowdfunding platforms, I think, um, companies will start getting crowdfunding licenses to enable other uh, ICOs to sell security tokens through those platforms. Uh, for example, in Lithuania, the, the regulator has also already stated that they're okay with the use of crowdfunding platforms for ICOs. And I think that's going to be a big trend. In the US, we see a lot of exemptions, applications for the crowdfunding exemption. Uh, right now, the SEC are taking their time, so we need to see what's going on there. But uh, it's definitely a hot thing. Okay, that's okay, sorry. Now, ICO-specific regulation. Um, ICO-specific regulation regulates mainly the tokens that are, not that are not securities, the tokens that are utility tokens. And what it means is you can get a stamp from a regulator that you're selling a utility token and that you're doing it right and that you're uh, uh, complying to all sorts of AML and, and transparency requirements. Uh, and that actually um, gives you a hechsher, right? Makes you kosher uh, to work in many, many uh, uh, markets. Now, right now, uh, we have Malta, 
Um, the new vi Virtual Financial Assets Act is expected to come out very soon. We have Gibraltar with the new token regulation. Um, we have Japan, which is a very strict act, very heavy. Uh, we have France that's contemplating a new ICO specific regulation. Actually, that's interesting because France is going to be very, very um, easy and convenient because uh, basically what's going to be there is just that you can choose whether to be regulated or not. And if you're not regulated, you need to put a disclaimer that you're not regulated, but you can still operate. So that's very interesting if that's the way it's going to be. Um, there are rumors of Singapore trying to push new ICO specific regulation because of the many ICOs that are being conducted there. Let's talk a little bit about crypto exchanges. We all like them, right? We all think they are uh, the unicorns of our industry, but it's getting harder and harder to operate as a crypto exchange if you don't have a license. First of all, it's going to be harder for you to open a bank account, and eventually uh, you're going to be, probably you're going to be exposed to many, many uh, AML anti-money laundering um, uh, incidents. So crypto exchanges right now in most jurisdictions are not regarded as a special creature. Most regulators are saying, okay, you're a crypto exchange, we don't care. You're going to need the same license as if you were a normal exchange. And that's what's going on right now. Um, so you have the US where you have to uh, get a money service business license in each and every state where you want to have clients from. You have Hong Kong where you need to get an MSO, money service operator license. Uh, you have Lithuania, you can do that through an e-money institution license there. Uh, you have UK with the usual financial license in Germany, Luxembourg, Switzerland, all of them don't have special crypto exchanges licenses. Uh, it's just the existing license. In Australia, Austrac, which is sort of like the uh, um, anti-money laundering authority of Australia, they issued new regulations for crypto exchanges with specific guidelines on anti-money laundering and KYC requirements. So that's interesting. And it's actually pretty easy to obtain. So if the Australian market interests you, that's something you should know about and start pursuing. It doesn't take long, it's not very complicated. Um, the European Fifth AML Directive uh, is going to include virtual currencies, it's going to include virtual currency exchanges, and it's going to uh, make uh, KYC on these exchanges over 150 euros transaction mandatory. So that's a big change. So, what's hot? Um, in my eyes, these are the jurisdictions that in my eyes are worth um, that you consider them, whether you're going to do an ICO, whether you're going to establish an exchange. Uh, UK, so the UK is an expensive jurisdiction, but a reputable one, one that has a regulator that for a change actually understands fintech and is actually willing uh, and, and is innovating. Um, they have the sandbox program, uh, they have a whole team of people just waiting for your startup. I'm, I'm saying waiting, doesn't, it's not really because it takes time, but waiting for you to come to them and, and, and say, okay, what do I need to do regulatory-wise? Um, Gibraltar, you have the new token regulation. As I said, it's going to regulate all kinds of tokens. Um, Gibraltar is, is a good jurisdiction um, just because it has, you know, 0% VAT, it will have the new license, it has already accumulated a reputation as a good uh, crypto jurisdiction. You have Malta, the contending blockchain island. They're uh, marketing themselves right now like that uh, with the Virtual Financial Assets Act. Actually, um, the way to distinguish between security tokens and utility tokens has already been published by the MFSA, so it's worth, it's worth reading because it sheds light on how a regulator actually advises you to uh, classify your token and what questions you need to ask yourself to understand where you stand from a legal perspective. Um, Austria. So Austria has no clear, you know, 
crypto specific regulation or anything like that. But I think that the Austrian regulator is, is a sensible one. Um, also have, they also have an innovative approach. There are not a lot of utility token ICOs are conducted from there because there is no strict uh, statement uh, by the regulator yet. So, um, and they have some good, good banks there that are open towards crypto activities that, that are conducted from Austria. So that's interesting. Estonia, of course, um, many of you probably know, it's a hot jurisdiction for everything that has to do with crypto. They have the virtual currency exchange license. Um, and it's, it's, it's a good jurisdiction. It's within the EU. It's relatively cheap, but you need to consider banks there are very problematic. Um, the fact that you have a license, uh, if you don't have any actual business ties to Estonia, no actual office there, you're not going to be able to open a bank account there. So just so you know. Uh, France, I spoke about that. Lithuania. Um, in Lithuania, you have the e-money institution license. It's, it's not an easy license to obtain. It requires uh, 350,000 euros capital. But if you separate your crypto activity from your fiat activity, meaning you're not doing both of, both of them within the same license, then basically the regulator, is, uh, the central bank, is okay with you conducting crypto activities with a special designated EMI license. Singapore, so the MAS, the, the financial regulator in Singapore, is very advanced, is very progressive, uh, but banks are basically impossible in Singapore. Um, I know it's a very popular ICO jurisdiction, um, but um, it's interesting, it has good reputation, but you need to consider the bank's issue. Philippines, the special uh, economic zone in the Philippines has a new license now, um, actually regulating all kinds of crypto activities. doesn't matter what you do if you're a miner, if you're, there are a lot of mining firm, farms in the Philippines, but if you're a miner, if you're a crypto exchange, if you're an ICO, uh, you can go for that sort of license and, and you know, if you want sort of an offshore or Asian uh, low-level license, let's say. Uh, Cayman Islands, it's a good offshore jurisdiction. If you want to go offshore and you don't want to spend the money and resources on, you know, regulation or, or, or expensive European jurisdictions, Cayman is good because it's a financial center. It has relatively good reputation and a lot is going on there in terms of offshore crypto. So, do I have time for contemplations or? Yeah? Okay. So, some of my personal opinions. Uh, this will not uh, be uh, in line with but what Bobby Lee said in the morning, but I think we should embrace regulation. I think regulation is good for our market. We do not want to be branded as crooks, as scammers, as fraudulent, opportunistic companies that are just trying to make their way into the uh, uh, venture capital world through ICOs. We don't want that. We want to be in order, we want to be organized, and I think regulation improves market stability, it improves our reputation, it improves the industry because it clears out the bad apples. Um, and I think that in time, with time, um, regulation is going to be a very good thing for cryptocurrency prices because regulation means that the big actors can come and play the institutional, the funds, the, all, the, all the money that matters uh, can, can participate, and that's a very big uh, plus. Uh, okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, Javier. Uh, moving on to one of the jurisdictions which were not on the list, I wonder why. <laughs> but uh, which did everything very swiftly and persuasively. Uh, Dmitry, if you could uh, tell us more about uh, the recent experience in our neighbor Belarus.
Uh, good, evening, good, good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. I hope this is because of the fact that Belarus now is in the crypto game. I, call, I uh, named my presentation Bra Breathtaking Opportunities for blockchain-related businesses from all over the world. Uh, and I'll try to prove that. Um, so you probably know that on the 21st of December uh, last year, the president of Belarus adopted the decree on digital economy, which legalized um, crypto-related business and blockchain-related business. Uh, we were, as a law firm, we were engaged for uh, drafting the decree. This is because uh, uh, we are supporting, we are, we are making mostly transactional work in the field of inter information technologies. We supported, for example, a number of uh, very interesting uh, groundbreaking transactions in Belarus. Um, I'll give you uh, a quick overview, uh, a big picture of what we have in that decree because decree is very uh, big, versatile, complex document but I'll talk a little bit uh, on, uh, on uh, blockchain-related aspects of that decree. Um, in Belarus, we have a so-called high technology spark. Uh, this is a special beneficial uh, regulatory and tax, uh, let's say, regime for all the IT-based companies. There are uh, a lot of types of activities we, which are allowed uh, for the companies to be operated in, in, in uh, high technology spark. First of all, it was software development, uh, then educational activity, activity in the sphere of cyber sport, and due to the latest decree, uh, also activities in the sphere of blockchain is allowed. Um, so I can say that that decree legalized blockchain-related and crypto-related business. Uh, and specifically, specifically uh, companies in Belarus can, um, can operate as cryptocurrency exchanges, can perform mining. Both come, by the way, both companies as, and natural persons are allowed to, to mine cryptocurrency. Uh, you can operate in the field of initial coin offerings both in the initial coin offerings and uh, uh, providing services in that field. And wh wh what is very important, the decree uh, does not limit the types of activities which can be operated. Uh, the world is moving very fast and we, we didn't want, when drafting the decree, we didn't want to limit the types of activities allowed. Um, this is a, this is a, um, a big picture of, of how the um, projects can be uh, structured in Belarus. As I have already told, we have a high technology spark. It is a regulatory sandbox. Well, so we have that approach. For example, if you would like to, to uh, establish a crypto exchange in Belarus, or if you would like to, to make an initial coin uh, an offering provider, then you have to register in the in, in the high technology spark. Um, it's not limited. To, well, it's not limited. Uh, it's not a, a territory. It's just a, a regulatory uh, regime. So you can um, establish a company anywhere in Belarus and then uh, prepare a business project, a business plan, and submit it to the high technology spark for review. If it's okay, you can, you can be admitted and operate in the field of crypto, crypto business. If you would like, for example, uh, start your ICO from the territory of Belarus, you, you need to establish a, a branch company in Belarus. Uh, this is indicated in that picture. So then you can uh, attract uh, ICO service provider, which is registered in, in the High Technologies Park and make ICO with the help of that company. Um, so uh, after you collect the crypto, the, the cryptocurrency, you can exchange it for, with the help of uh, crypto, crypto exchanges, uh, again, which is registered in the high technologies park. Um, what we are doing right now, we in Belarus, we are 
uh, developing, let's say, secondary uh, regulations for that field, um, especially uh, for such activities as crypto, crypto exchanges. They're almost, they're almost ready uh, for, for publishing, so I, I hope it will be published very soon. Um, uh, what is very exciting about Belarus is that uh, we have very, very interesting, very beneficial uh, tax, um, uh, tax aspects of blockchain business. Uh, we have exempt uh, all the crypto, crypto, um, crypto related uh, operations from taxation. So we have a company in Belarus registered in High Technologies Park. You will not pay income tax, profit tax, you will not pay value added tax. Offshore duty, it is until 2023. Why we did this is because when we were drafting the decree, it was, we started that in, uh, in February 2017, so there were no approaches in the world toward, toward taxation of, of the crypto. That is why uh, the government decided to, uh, well, to, to provide so-called uh, tax, tax holidays for that kind of business. What you have to pay, I mean, your company has to pay a 1% cont contribution from the, from, from the um, revenue generated by your crypto business. Um, the good news is also that if you have a company in Belarus registered in the High Technologies Park, there are lower taxes in regard to the salary so your employees will be taxed only with a 9% flat uh, tax rate in regard to the income. As to the social security fund contribution, they are also reduced. Each employee will pay only uh, 150, approximately 150 US dollars per month per each employee, irrespective of the size of, of the salary of that employee. Uh, the good news is also that um, being a shareholder of the Belarusian company registered in the High Technologies Park, uh, you will you will uh, being a shareholder, you will pay uh, decreased decreased um, taxes in regard to your dividends. It's only nine percent from your dividends. Uh, if you would like to sell your company, and in case you own the shares of that company, at least for uh, for one year, then you will also pay zero tax in case you 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 you'll exit from that business. Um, we, when we were drafting the degree, we thought that um, there should be some simplified rules for for foreigners to come to Belarus and operate, to to manage the companies, to to work in the Belarusian companies. So we uh, greatly simplified the employment regulations in Belarus. F we have canceled all the foreign labor permits in Belarus for the companies registered in the High Technologies Park. We have also canceled requirements for the companies to receive our permissions for engagement on foreigners. Uh, and the temporary residence uh, for um, uh, for for uh, the employees uh, are granted in an automatic mode, and which is very important. We have visa-free entrance, which is which is uh, up to 180 days, which is pretty much, frankly speaking, in comparison to other jurisdictions. So, to 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 make a bottom line for all that. I'll, I'll, I'll say come to Belarus and, well, if you would like to, yeah, thank, <laughs> thanks, for, thanks for your attention. Come to Belarus and I think, well, it's very beneficial for your business. Thank you, Dmitry. Thank you. There are, it's one more reason to come to Belarus because until recently uh, there the, the were quite a lot of uh, IT businesses that uh, had... Uh, a worldwide success uh, being based in Belarus. Uh, but now we've got crypto. Uh, turning to uh, Dmitry Shimkiv, uh, what can we, uh, what do you think we, we can have in Ukraine or what we should have in Ukraine? Thank you. Uh, first of all, I think what 
I will try to give a perspective on the thinking of the uh, regulators. Because I think what, what happened in Belarus was an interesting because there was an initiative coming with a very structured legal company behind putting things together. What happened in Ukraine, it, we, we start getting an, an interesting movement. So um, in, on the 30th of November last year, the three regulators, basically National Bank of Ukraine, Regulator for Securities and Financial Services made a statement. And it's quite an interesting statement because it's just saying we're going to continue exploring, but they also in this statement try to make a definition. Uh, so they try to qualify what is cryptocurrencies. And they clearly stated that this is not cash, this is not currency, this is not payment tool, uh, it's not a foreign currency, it's not electronic money, it's not stock, and it's not currency simulator. So they basically say under Ukrainian legislation it doesn't exist, uh, which is actually extremely helpful uh, for a lot of folks in this audience. But it's actually create a, a legal vacuum for the definition of what it is. Before, uh, besides that, we have two legislation, two draft of laws in the Ukrainian parliament, which get stuck and been criticized by three regulators. Uh, and now the decision being issued in February this year that they will, uh, by the head of the committee of the financial regulations, that they try to combine two laws into one. But I think in this kind of discussion, what I'm hearing, what I just said, it's a, it's a work done by regulators. So where's the community? And we had a beautiful discussion about self-regulated organizations, but let's park it to the end. So where's the community, where's the proposals? And I think that we have, in, in, as, as, as elsewhere, in, particularly in high-tech industry as well, the communities, the industry is trying to stay behind, not to touch regulated, but they don't touch us. But I think we need to look at the examples of other countries. And I want to go back to what really uh, people are discussing from the regulator's perspective in the world. Uh, cryptocurrencies being, and blockchain being the subject of discussion at the annual IMF meeting, or spring IMF meeting. Uh, you could see a big article in the Bankers uh, magazine trying to summarize how different uh, central banks look in it. And in general, central banks look like the first slide at this meeting. Warning, risk, etc. There's three things regulators look at. First, uh, or concern, let's put it, they need to answer a question. They need, they are concerned about money laundering. This is one. Second, the, and they need to secure that there is a full transparency and adherence to international and currency country approach. Second, they need to ensure security of the citizens and that's primary concern of regulators. Uh, will they not be cheated? Will how they can be protected, etc. And third, it's a financial stability of the country if they attach currency to, uh, to cryptocurrencies, how, it's, how the relationship takes place, what the exchange is, etc. So they're primarily looking at this from these three perspectives. Uh, and that's why you don't see much of the concerns of innovation, etc., because majority of regulators do not understand. And then they prefer not to look at it, or they prefer not to regulate it, rather than actually look into the deep into the solution. And there are countries that's been mentioned in the second presentation that are going there. But the first, what is interesting is that there is no unanimous approach what is cryptocurrency in the world. So, and I think the first, when we talk about regulation, we need to split regulation in probably two pieces. One is a definition, so we bring the cryptocurrency in the legal space, and that's what Ukraine needs now. And then they make a decision, do we regulate or not regulate? Because that's what we actually see in other countries. Because uh, I, I was thinking because to, to go through the countries and say where, which, what. But uh, in order to save time, I'll just skip it. But there are countries where cryptocurrency is currency, but currency which cannot be used as a trading tool. Uh, so there is countries where they define it as a financial instrument. There is countries where they find this as an asset. 
the countries that are defining this as a software. There is country which is defined, particularly Finland. Uh, there is a countries where they are defining this as their uh, services uh, provided with the tools of machines and computers, Britain. So there is a variety of definitions what it is. So actually Ukraine needs to make a choice. And there is two options. Either regulators and law makers make a decision, or the community come with a proposal with it. And that's what really needed now. What is cryptocurrencies? What is IC? Because until this is defined, we could still see the situation where if suddenly you lose your wallet or token, or it gets stolen, you can't even claim in Ukrainian courts that you lost something because there is no definition of the value of what you lost. And that's why the definition of this is very critical. And that's what was, was brought by the uh, Secretary of National Security uh, and Defense Council. So this is first definition. And then we need to answer the second question, taxation. Because the definition would lead to taxation. The same thing, country by country, the first thing usually countries try to define definition and taxation. And then comes the topic of regulation. And it depends country by country. Denmark says we don't regulate. Uh, countries say we do regulate it, but within, for example, exchanges. There are countries that say we prefer to uh, not to use that. So this is not, the cryptocurrency cannot be used as a tool of exchange. In other places, they do allow. So today, in the global world, there is no ubiquitous approach to, every, to the cryptocurrency. And I think the Ukrainian regulators or lawmakers are currently in the process of defining, discussing, looking outside, but not making the first step. And I think one of the purpose of this discussion is actually to trigger conversation where the, the work in Ukraine should start. Should it stop with the authorities, like in Belarus, or should it be a joint work of Ukrainian society or industry jointly with the government? Thank you, Dmitry. Uh, we, I actually prepared lots of questions, but uh, I guess in terms of timing, we are off. Uh, let me ask just one question uh, to follow up on what you were saying. Uh, do we need? Do you think we need uh, the uniform regulation? Uh, do we like in, when we talk about the regulation in the global sense? Uh, do we need each country to copycat each other, or is there a danger in such approach? And w all other speakers will welcome to to respond as well. And then we we will uh, uh, wrap up. And uh, if to the extent the guy you you have any questions or speakers, will uh, we can we can chat uh, after the after the break. If we would have a global, un kind of uh, unique, anonymous, un anonymous approach, it would be much easier to implement the regulation because there is a diversity in the world. It's difficult to look at the best model to be implemented, or unless we would like to pioneer, introduce our own, and then the world will, will just be one of the many options. Uh, would be great to have a common. Uh, in the World Economic Forum and uh, you know IMF and other institutions are looking into defining and defining the common, but as we already seen through the two first presentation, there is already so many diversity streams going on, and I could not envision they will converge into one unique legislation or approach internationally. It will be great to have. But I think we'll have to find lean to one of the options. Thanks. Frankly speaking, we are not against copy pasting our law, so feel free to copy paste it. Well, thank you so much to our speakers. Uh, I think uh, I think yeah, we can have a few questions from the audience uh, if you don't mind.
So, Mr. Shimkiv, uh, the question for you. Uh, you say that uh, Ukraine doesn't have a low regulation for cryptocurrency at all. So, uh, your point of view, the first step to make this regulation in our country. Thank you. I think uh, the, the, the first step is to make a definition, to, to bring the cryptocurrencies into the legal space. Today, if you look at the legal space, it doesn't exist. And this is, again, this is, there is a common statement which has been released by regulators who says, it's not this, it's not this, it's not this, it's, it's nothing we regulate, so it doesn't exist. We need to bring first bring it to the definition through different legal bodies, either through the legislation or through the decision of one of the regulators to define this is this. Is it a set? Maybe it's software, maybe it's service, maybe it's currency, what it is. And then bring regulation in. So this is the question for our government, yes? You know, we can go to court as well, but this is a hard way. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Just an extension on the part about there uh, not being any laws defining cryptocurrencies in Ukraine. Does that mean if there was a group of Ukrainian hackers that took 100 million worth of cryptocurrency from a foreign exchange, there's absolutely no repercussions in Ukraine? Based on... I think that in, it will be a repercussions in Ukraine of the intrusions into information systems. Got it. Okay. But you could not claim the amount of the value of stolen. So it will be an intrusion into IT systems that would be a legally binding uh, case. So people can get in trouble, but so it don't. They will be legal for out. hacking, not for stealing. They will be uh, liable for hacking and stealing information. Got it. But they could not be attributed to the stealing at you know, money, let's put it this way. In other words, criminal liability, yes. Uh, if you go and try to get something in, in, in a civil action or like in a business action, then you, you don't get anything, potentially. It's, it would be very hard. So, uh -huh. you, you, if, you're someone, if you're someone who had your money taken, right, you wouldn't ever be able to get that money back. The people uh, might get in trouble. There may be issues with that. Anyway, you put the guy uh, in the Ukrainian prison, but claim the money in the States. Question of jurisdiction of the, of the issue, etc. Sure, sure, sure. The point sure. is this, uh, under Ukrainian legislation, money is a file yeah. with a number. Guys, do we have one last question? If not, we wrap I have, up and... I, I have two questions. Oh, yeah, here, okay, cool. Where, here. Where are you? Yeah, I have two questions to Mr. Shimkiv. The first one, uh, don't you think that it is quite convenient for Ukraine not to re regulate? Because it would be easy to shut down business. It would be easy for tax verifications. The same what happened with IT companies. Do you remember the period when IT companies, many IT companies were accused in uh, porno video, were accused in gambling and so on and so forth. And the second question, don't you think that while Ukrainians, uh, like particularly government and national bank, will think about definitions, the countries like Belarus will do some actions and in a few years, Ukraine also will be like a late runner, like, like in the last rows. Uh, take into account that I'm present in the, blo uh, in the you know, uh, blockchain conference. Uh, uh, it will be weird to give you a speech uh, that I'm hearing at their uh, central banks or financial institution opinions. Uh, we had an interesting discussion how many banks in the United States are dealing with the cryptocurrencies. Uh, so I think that what we need to make is to bring this into the legal space and let the innovation run it and the, and the industry run it and then we see what it is. Because if you, look, if you look at the situation from the financial industry perspective, it's currently, especially if it's central banks or financial 
regulated, they will be extremely conservative. They will primarily will talk about risk to the citizens, etc., etc. They will be not talking about innovation. This community here has a different perspective, and it's absolutely correct. I think it's an innovation, and there is some, something in the in between. So, and the state cannot be bound to one opinion and another opinion. The state needs to look at the both opinions. That's why it needs to bring it to the legal framework. So that's my opinion that the government of Ukraine or the Ukrainian legislation, not that much government, the Ukrainian legislative framework needs to bring the definition of the cryptocurrencies, the, the bring it into the legal domain of Ukrainian legislation. Attach the crimes and activities uh, uh, related to this type of industry to, into to other things. So we, we, if, if money gets stolen, if crypto money gets stolen, then there is a liability. The same as being stolen, what, assets or something, because currently it's a file. It's a file being stolen. Does it mean, does it mean that Ukraine, a particular Ukrainian government, doesn't want to take uh, initi initiative, yes, and to start the process, just it is also convenient to wait for the rest of the world, yes, to start the process and to see what is going in the world and not to start it like again because like there were many articles about saying that Ukraine, this is a country where this cryptocurrency blockchain business, it is a country where it, it has like brought, um, how it is called, uh, um, many opportunities for development. So why, why don't we take initiative and start this process? Why so how about I welcome you to draft the proposal, get people together and come back to us and I think this will be a good way forward. Or you would like a bunch of folks who have no idea what is crypto market to develop a legal law or develop laws for you? I don't think so. I would rather see industry going, stepping forward, stepping with the proposals and getting this learning from the, the best options existing on the, in the world and trying to lend it into, uh, into Ukrainian legal framework and then push and lobby it to make it a, a, a adopted rather than, you know, legislators who have very vague ideas develop it. Thank you. Yeah, I think, I think this is a great, welcome. Uh, welcome. great uh, line to wrap it up. Uh, to follow up on uh, what uh, Avia was saying, don't be afraid of regulation. And uh, frankly, uh, if you guys want to uh, uh, have amazing, uh, risk-free uh, and growing environment, do participate, be active. Uh, I, th I vouch for the community to actually get involved because I'm, for example, uh, a part of many initiatives. We work with all regulators. Uh, I'm a member of the uh, basically all working groups. And uh, we do have uh, a lack, capital L, of specialists and enthusiasts uh, not, who not only want to help, but uh, are willing to commit time and resource to help. So I guess together we can bring something which will be exciting. Thank you so much. Thank you.